Good afternoon, Namaskar. I would say this is the most difficult conversation of this summit because climate change does not have fun political one-liners. Climate change is not dramatic or urgent. Uh, some 50 to 70 countries are going to polls this year. I'm not sure climate change is an election issue in, in even five of them. It's, it's a footnote in most policy documents. It's everyone's problem, yet no one wants to solve it. Summers are getting hotter, winters are getting colder, freak weather is becoming more common, billions are being lost in economies the world over, climate refugees pose the next big challenge, and some countries face extinction. So what we want to ask today is what will it take for us and our world to take climate change seriously? With me are two uh, very well-qualified and eminent personalities to talk about this, Amina Ghurib Fakim, former President Mauritius, also a biodiversity scientist, and Eric Solheim, former executive director of the United Nations Environment Program with an extensive career focusing on climate change. Welcome to rising Bharat and to India. Uh, Amina Ghurib Fakim, the world is talking a lot more about climate change, but is this talk translating into policy and action? Are we doing better at mitigating the climate crisis than, than we were, say, 10 years ago? Um, good morning, and again, Falki, thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure always to be back in India. Uh, we are, I'm here in India, and uh, we are heading precisely towards the COP29, which will be held in Baku this year. Um, you've mentioned something very important, the climate crisis. <clears throat> I think we all acknowledge that climate change is a threat uh, to, the, to the world, to our survival on this planet. And are we taking it seriously? Uh, you know, if we are to look at uh, the crisis, the COVID crisis, I think it gives us an idea. It's a harbinger of what's to come in the future. And uh, what we find, of course, is that the concept, rather the narrative, is still shaped in the us and them. Us, me, you, 85% of the global population is in the global south, and of course, the 15% of the global north. We still haven't realized that we have one planet, there's no planet B. If we go back to the COPs, which have been, of course, the key uh, institution looking at the climate crisis, we find that uh, we still do not find, do not seem to be able to get the consensus around this issue. The successful COP may have been the COP21 in Paris when the NDCs were approved and countries realized that we have a common, but we need a differentiated approach. And this differentiated approach comes down to money, comes down to finance. And uh, we still, as we speak now, so many years after Paris, we still haven't come to the consensus of capitalizing the $100 billion for helping adaptation. I'm not talking about mitigation, but I'm talking about ad adaptation. We have seen subsequently incremental narratives of uh, the Bridgetown Initiative. We talk about the loss and damage funds, but still they remain empty boxes. It becomes us versus them because someone has to fund climate action, Eric Solheim. Um, and as, from where I'm seeing it, it's, it's not a problem of money because there are governments that have poured billions of dollars into wars and the wars that suit them. So the money goes to Ukraine, but not necessarily to, say, the Sudan. Uh, so there is money. Is this a problem of lack of funds or lack of political will? The, the money is not a problem. That's uh, what people speak about in international conferences, but it's not really the problem. And the reason for that is very simple. The price of solar energy has fallen by 90% in one decade. The price of wind energy has fallen by 85% in one decade. So if today, if you sh make the shift from solar, sorry, from coal or from uh, fossil fuels into renewables, not only is good for the health, everyone knows. Not good, only is good for Mother Earth, everyone knows. It's also very good for the economy. It's cheaper, and that's why the calculus of the past was, uh, was a thing of the past. In the 20th century, if you wanted to grow the economy, there was no other way than coal. That's why Europe did it, America did it, China did it, and India started doing it. But today, you can grow the economy by uh, renewables, and frankly, this is why Prime Minister Modi is now leading in the right direction. Because, mind you, he gets the big picture right. 
Prime Minister Modi understands that climate change and environment action is not a burden for India. It's an enormous opportunity. It's an opportunity for more jobs, getting people out of poverty, but get doing it in a green way. And if I may add, maybe the best slogan I ever heard uh, in India on Bharat on this was Ola, uh, the Uber of India, as you all know. They have a wonderful factory in Tamil Nadu, young Tamil ladies making electrical scooters, and the slogan is really captivating. It says, Tesla for the West, Ola for the rest. Of course, meaning that Bharat can get any number of jobs from moving into the green economy. You make interesting points, and you were telling me earlier that, that you, you believe that Indian culture is the best suited for climate action. Uh, do you want to tell our, our audience about that? So Indian culture, you said, is, is better suited. Look, uh, the old Brits had a, to put it mildly, very unfavorable view of the Hindu Dharma or the traditional Indian culture. They saw it as a second-rate uh, religion, with any number, millions of gods, didn't take it seriously at all. Then switch to 2024, and Hindu Dharma looks like the most modern of all religions. Why? Because look in Christianity, while there is a strong drive to protect nature in Christianity, still the perspective is always that the human being is superior. Human being is superior to nature. While in Hindu Dharma, Man is part of nature. He, man is in nature. And that now looks such a modern perspective. And the old Indians, they venerated nature. They did it even to the extent of making God half animal, half human. I mean, Ganesh, half elephant, half human. Hanuman, half monkey, half human. And can there, be no, can there be a stronger signal of the unity of man, humans, and nature than making God half nature, half uh, human? So what the Brits spoke so negatively about 100 years ago is now looking as the most modern of all global thought systems. That's a very interesting perspective. Um, uh, Amina, Hurib, Fakim, uh, your thoughts on, on what India is doing. And you know, countries like India, even China, have developmental requirements. Same with Mauritius. You know, uh, you're, you're, as, as uh, the president, I'm sure you've seen this firsthand, the challenges that climate change poses to you and your people. Uh, so you have to uh, find a way to balance the two. How do you think these countries are doing? Um, <laughs> First of all, uh, I just pick up to what uh, Eric has just said. The approach uh, that uh, the global south and uh, India, Asia, of course, and China, I think the approach is that we are very much part of the ecosystem and that we need to start respecting nature and th the solutions will be, of course, in nature. But you mentioned something about the challenges of climate and how India and uh, in the most Asian countries, even China, are tackling. Uh, I think the, the, the plan is there. There is a game plan to address this. I think many of the rising emerging economies, of course, India is one of them, they have the plan. But I have a but. We are all integrated in the global economy. And this, of course, is the lifeblood of any country, is to see to it that trade increases so that jobs can be created. And my concern is that because of the competition, because of the moving geotectonic plates around the world, especially now that India and China are rising, is that there could be a, a break to this rise. And the break will come because when we start tying down trade to the climate. It's a good point, but there is a downside to it. It can become a break. I mean, also have to bring in Africa because this is where I hail from is that there will be a tendency to link up trade to cleaner technologies. And those countries that haven't played catch up, they will find big problems in terms of precisely benchmarking themselves to that level to see to it that trade happens. And that what I fear will be the tendency moving forward. And I think this is where I think India, I'm sure, is already mindful of the way that she's going to progress in the future because India is set to become, of course, that now we are fifth, we are going to be, of course, higher in the ranking of emerging economies. So this is something that has to be borne in mind. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, the, the 
the debate on who is going to take responsibility. And that also brings us to the point of historical responsibility. And there are countries that have contributed more to emissions. Uh, uh, do you think that's a valid point that the Global South makes? And do you feel let down by rich countries that do not put their money where their mouth is? Uh, absolutely. I mean, if you look at the continent of Africa, it has been less than 3% in terms of global, global emission. Uh, the Global North has been 25% as we speak. There has been an initiative to capitalize the fund, and here I make a pledge for more funds for adaptation. And where we are falling short is that the needs of the Global South, excluding China, is $1 trillion per year. And I don't see any country or any institution that is able to actually match and bring forward th this amount of, of fund. So this will be the, the race. And again, the 100 billion which has come on board since Paris hasn't been capitalized. We still have a gap. And if you look at 100 billion in the world global economy of 100 trillion, it's not a lot. But I don't see the will or the, or the appetite to take this risk to help poorer countries adapt. And this is where we are failing because the, the future of the world will depend on the growth in the global south. And of course, uh, the prosperity in global south matters. If you take one item like immigration, we find that how much this is impacting, of course, the global north and of course the global south economies. Is it domestic politics, Eric Solheim, that, that impacts this? Because you know, we've seen, we've seen climate deniers take high offices. We've seen the former US president who's in the race again. Uh, we've seen others. Uh, we've seen that when governments change, and now we're looking at many elections across the world, uh, some regimes come with more intense and focused climate policies, and others do not. And we know that climate action requires consistency. Uh, so do you think domestic politics plays a role, and how can we, we change that? Uh, look, first of all, of course, no one should blame India or the global south for climate change. Uh, the emissions of the United States of America up to this point are 25 times uh, Indian emissions per capita. So stop blaming the global south. By the way, American emissions are also eight times Chinese emissions per capita. So get that out of the picture. Uh, the one thing the environment movement gets wrong, in my view, is it sometimes framing the message as a message for the young and trendy. Uh, but the message cannot be just for the young and trendy in Mumbai or Bengaluru. It must also be for the farmer in Uttar Pradesh, or for the coal worker in Jharkhand, or for the housewife in Telangana. I mean, it must be for the people. And the message is sometimes also so incredibly boring, it doesn't really work. So we need a better messaging to the people. And we need to do it much more about the law for nature, uh, I'll make it a lot more fun, a lot more exciting, and maybe the most important of all, get out the message that the green transformation is, the, is a help to the people, not a cost. It's an enormous achievement. Uh, let me just give you a few examples from India itself. In Gujarat Desert, the Adani Group is now building the biggest individual solar and wind plant in the world. It's as much energy as all the hydropower consumption of my nation, Norway, and we are fully fueled by hydropower at a very, very high level of consumption. That one plant is as much as we consume uh, overall in Norway. Then, in Umkareshwar in Madhya Pradesh at the Narmada River, LNT and Hartex Solar and other companies are building the biggest floating solar in the world. Uh, amazing. It's, a, it's as much as four times the most controversial hydropower plant, again, in my nation, Norway. So it's big. And when Prime Minister Modi came back from Ayodhya, from the Ram Mandir, his first step was to say, look, Ram was about energy. Can I serve the people of India better than launching an initiative for one crore, 10 million rooftop solar? The initiative is already out there. Go into the internet and Google it and, uh, and look into whether you can uh, apply for it yourself. So, and of course, all these are beneficial to the people, creating jobs, creating prosperity, and making sure that India do not need to pay for oil from Norway or from Russia or from Saudi Arabia, but can use the money for the people back home. But we need to change the conversation from a very boring, 
very center of a few young people in the city uh, conversation to this amazing conversation of how, how all people, also farmers and workers, everyone will benefit from the green transformation. So change the conversation. That's an interesting point again. Uh, Amina Guri Fakim, we cannot talk about climate change and not mention big oil. And it's interesting that the last COP summit was hosted by one of the biggest oil producers in the world. Um, there is again a debate on whether we should co-op them and can petrodollars meaningfully fund green transition? Is that the only way forward now? Um, Palki, there is a lot of conversation about um, oil. And I think last COP in Dubai, they had a big problem actually getting the wordings right in terms of phasing out oil. And uh, unfortunately, uh, if we call them down to brass tack, it will be difficult to phase out oil immediately. But I think what uh, we can get from the oil industry is precisely their CSR in terms of capitalizing the global funds to be, to be able to help countries adapt. And I think this is where we make a pledge because we are in election year in the United States, in India, in many of the major countries, we are going to go for election. So capitalizing the great, of the green fund will not be a priority by many countries. We are, of course, running out of time, but we make a pledge to the big corporations. And this is where the SDGs make a difference vis-a-vis -vis the MDGs, because this is where we call for the contribution of the private sector. So if the private sector can help come on board and help capitalize the fund and help us reach this $1 trillion so that this, this global south can help adapt, because again, I will say, the global north depend on the global south because we provide the branch on which we are all sitting for our own survival. So it's in our interest to fund the funds to help adapt because mitigation is already happening. Also, COP summits tend to have a very big participation, uh, 70,000 in the Dubai summit, uh, which I understand that they want to bring more voices on board, but it makes consensus that much more difficult. You mentioned the private sector. Uh, there's a, increasingly a pitch with sustainable uh, products that are, uh, that are being pushed out in the market. Uh, do you think that, that it's just window dressing as of now? Do you think that there is a serious uh, commitment uh, when the, where the private sector is concerned uh, that they want to make a difference and bring uh, become part of climate change, climate action? So far, there have been remained pledges, and the pledges haven't been translated into solid dollars. But I think when you look at a country like India, for example, which has, had, which has a very big agriculture base, while we actually uh, lambast agriculture as being an emitter, I think India has, can play a key role in transforming the ag sector into a net absorber. And uh, this, with these tools, that India can bring in terms of technology, and India has got very strong institutions in terms of addressing this, I think it can be, it can be a great boon uh, in terms of addressing the climate crisis and become a net absorber and also create jobs. And here I have a special plea to make because agriculture also means women, and we need to empower women to bring them on board to become these game changers in terms of addressing the climate crisis. Eric Solheim, I have some data. Um, Gen Z, 81% of them, according to a survey, the young generation, um, said that they were very concerned uh, about climate change and they've talked about uh, climate anxiety. Um, another set talks about uh, the multiplication of climate-related litigation. People are taking their governments to court. Uh, what is your message to the youth? Do you think that making climate action legally binding and forcing policymakers to look at this is the only way forward now? I mean, all in favor of that. I mean, cannot be uh, agree more than to any global agreement which will enforce uh, regulations on climate. However, there is no need to wait for that because acting on climate in India or any other place is creating more jobs, saving money on the, global, on, on the budget and creating a much healthier and better society. So there's no need to wait for someone else. But if I may, uh, since we come maybe to the close to the conversation, also make a couple of challenges uh, to India and what, what, are the two, what are the main issues India need to work on to do even better? I think one is still red tape. Uh, it takes too long to get permissions for renewable energies. That's, by the way, not just an Indian problem. It's a massive problem in the United States, in Europe, everywhere. 
<clears throat> uh, one of the biggest windmakers in, in Europe told me, look, it takes a lot longer to get the permission to construct offshore wind than it actually takes to, uh, <laughs> to make, make, put up the windmills. Uh, and I think one reason why a state like Gujarat seems to be uh, from uh, in the lead in India, maybe that, that they got the relationship to business right at an early stage. It's a more efficient system, uh, uh, a more business-friendly system. Tamil Nadu is also in the lead, maybe for some other similar reasons. So cutting red tape is central. And the other, which may not be so popular to talk about in India, is the relationship to China. Because China is 60% of everything green in the entire world. Don't look to the West. They are far behind India. The only nation in, in the world which may be ahead of India is China. China is 60% of wind, solar, hydropower, electric cars, electric batteries, high-speed rail, whatever you look to, I think China is dominating. I think I'm, so, I'm going to interu uh, interrupt there. Just one, one, <laughs> one second on that. So uh, the relationship between China and India is key because tapping into this technology for India while at the same time onshoring the jobs here. I mean, people in Bharat need jobs, so that is a first-rate issue for the development of renewables. India-China is a, is a whole different conversation. Uh, time is up, but I want one last word from you, your message to climate deniers. Climate is happening, climate change is happening, and I think uh, all the indicators are pointing to this. But what I would uh, like to see is more power, more technology, more finance to help us all together ride the, the, the tide because it's time is running against us. And let's empower the youth because I think they have, it's their planet at the end of the day. So we need to empower them. We need our women to ask us to actually bring on board the changes that we'd like to see. Thank you. Right. As they say, we are the first generation to feel the impact of climate change and we may be the last generation that can do something about it. Thank you very much for your thoughts and for being here today.